as one cracking pudding, a nomadic intellectual in a post-colonial world. Like many other great artists, he has a rising controversy, yet has remained true to his art, constantly refusing to avoid unwelcome topics. Characterizing his role as a writer, I thought to look and to look again, to relook and rethink. We relish this opportunity to be reminded that we who are so entangled in the, in the issues of modern day development and academic journey could benefit from such poignant reflection. We might also learn too that peace also means tolerance and respect of views that differ from our own and that all of our art has remained a vital means to achieve peace, a which connecting past and present, fantasy and reality, the familiar and unfamiliar, conflict and understanding. Thank you very much. Such as Clive Granger, Nobel Laureate of Economics, Dr. Ken 
economics uh, of 2003, Shirin Ebadi from Iran, Bishop Bello from East Timor, and Lee Chong Hume from Northern Ireland have already confirmed their participation, as well as other keynote speakers, including Boutros Boutros Ghali, former United Nations Secretary General, Anthony Giddens, Director of the School of, the School of Economics, Artist Robert Rauschenberg and writer Mario Vargasilosa. On behalf of the team of volunteers, we've worked almost day and night to make the British events even possible. I kindly invite you to join me in especially thanking Christian Grabschafter from Austria and Hegweiss and Stefan Biggershausen from Germany. Maybe can you come a little bit so that you will also see you from Germany. And Superfond Money Consult and Tawan Faraj from Thailand. We are all honored to present to you now the Nobel Laureate for Literature of 2001 until the year of nightfall who also came to Thailand without any fee or honorarium to support our events. And I greatly look forward to his reading and his important contribution to build the bridges. Thank you very much. He left the 
end of his birth in 1950 to pursue a degree in English at Oxford University, and ever since has made his home in England, despite extensive periods of travel abroad. On his graduation, he worked first as a journalist for the BBC, but felt that his calling was to be a writer, and indeed, he is one of the few writers who has made a career exclusively out of writing. After his first book, The Mystic Masseur, was published in 1957, he went on to write a host of books, both fiction and non-fiction, which have won numerous prestigious awards, such as the Hawthorne Prize for Mr. Stone and the Knight's Companion, the W.H. Smith Prize for The Mimic Men, the Booker Prize in 1971 for In a Free State, the Bennett Award, the T.S. Eliot Award, the British Literature Prize in 1993, and as we all know, uh, the 2001 Nobel Prize for Literature. Aside from his measure of literary recognition, however, Sir Vidya's life has been punctuated by a succession of travels, revisitings, and publications, which can be perhaps summoned, summed up by a statement he once made. A man was right to report his whole response to the world. Right now, this distinguished speaker is here to report this response by reading a section entitled Old Clothes, which he wrote in this book, which he incidentally dedicated to his wife, Nadira Kanam Alvin. Beyond Belief, Islamic Discursions Among Converted Peoples. In the prologue, where he tells us that this book is a follow-up of a book published 17 years before entitled Among the Believers about a journey to the same four countries. Naipaul begins by saying, this is a book about people. It is not a book about opinion. It is a book of stories. The stories were collected during five months of travel in 1995 in four non-Arab Muslim countries, Indonesia, Iran, Pakistan, and Malaysia. And so there, he concludes, is a context and a theme. And now, let us hear from our distinguished speaker. In 1979, 
I shifted the sun days from hotel to hotel before settling in at a holiday inn. It was the quietest place I could find, and I liked the setting. To the left was the race course, with a view in the distance of the Kuala Lumpur Hills. Around the race course, and in front of the hotel, was the rich greenery of the wet tropics, banana plants, flowering Kachipani, the great branching Sama or rain tree of Central America, which also you have outside here, the mingled vegetation of Asia, the Pacific, and the New World that spoke both of the great European explorations and the plantation colonies. It was the very vegetation I had known as a child on the other side of the world in Trinidad. And then, what was familiar about the setting? In 1979, it became strange. Just around the corner from the holiday inn was a little yellow box set in a wall or hedge. I was told it was a Chinese shrine. It had offerings. It might have been used by the Chinese taxi drivers who did hotel work. And the race course wasn't really a race course. Sometimes I saw horses being trailed there in the early mornings, before the sun came up, but I never saw a race. On Saturday and Sunday afternoons, Chinese people, for the most part, came in their cars and filled the grandstand. The race course itself, green and sunstruck, with still black shadows, remained empty. Every half hour, there was an amplified race commentary, and the grandstand crowd worked itself up to a frenzy, as if at a real race. The races were real, but they were going on somewhere else. The people in the grandstand were looking at television screens, and they had come to the race course to do so in a strange mimicry of a day of the race. Because it was the only place in Kuala Lumpur where gambling was permitted. Malaysia was racially divided. Malays, Chinese. The government was aggressively in Malay and Muslim. Gambling was un-Islamic. And this weekend race horse excitement was only a humane concession to the Chinese. They were the great gamblers. I had got in Kuala Lumpur in 1979 to Noor He was a Malay of 32, originally from a village in the still pastoral of the whole northeast. Though it could be said that Shafi had done well, had risen in the way his father and grandfather could not have imagined, he was full of rage as Malay. Shafi and Malay like him felt he had almost lost their they thought the Malays had sat for too long in their villages. Things grew too easy in the warm, fertile land. The old life of river and the forest was too rich and full. You could throw a seed, Charles said one day, and it would grow. You could put a bare hook in the water and catch a fish. <coughs> Used to that idea of the land, the village people, Charles said, have not seen or understood to what extent in the last hundred years they had been supplanted by Chinese and others. They had awakened now, late in the century, to find that Malays had become only half the population, and that a new way of life had developed all around them. They were not prepared for that new way. To be a Malay like Shah, half in, half out of the old ways, was to feel every kind of fear and frustration. It was too much for a man to bear his own. And in 1979, Islam was being made to carry that general rage. The days of Shafi's generation had become passionate believers. And their belief was given edge by Islamic missionaries who were especially busy in 1979 
with the revolution in Iran and the Islamizing terror of General Zia in Pakistan. The missionaries are spreading stories of Islamic success in those countries and promising similar success to people elsewhere if only they believed. The Islamic missionary world existed in its own bubble. The extension of the faith was its principal aim and, as for the 14th century traveler from Morocco, Ibn Battuta, once the faith ruled in any country, the conditions of the faithful didn't matter. It was at the holiday inn that Shafi used to come to see him. He wasn't an easy guest. He said he didn't like places like holiday inn, and he didn't hide his worry about the food. It might have been prepared by non-Muslims, by Chinese or by Indians. There were other things that would have offended him in the hotel. The modest little bar, where at night the group known as the old timers, sitting the days, with an Indian or two among them, sang pop songs. And there was a nightlife fashion show on Friday, Sabbath, when people came to see the Indian and Chinese girls he saw their shoulders and knew their walk in the rather stale, shuttered restaurant there. And there was a very small holiday in food, holiday in food, below the coffee shop window, where white women exposed themselves in the But shall we have stopped seeing, perhaps had never seen, what he rejected? He couldn't even tell, for instance, that I found one day when I asked him, whether the sunbathing women at the pool side were attractive. When he had first come to Kuala Lumpur as a schoolboy, he had been nervous. He had felt a stranger. Now he held himself a new foot and was strong in his self-righteousness. His ideas were sometimes confused. His Islam was being made to carry too many things. There was purity in his old village in Kota Baru. Purity in the life he had known there, which he had now lost. Yet he wished to be like a scourge of those religions, to convert them fully, to cleanse them of what had survived of old Hindu customs. That had become part of his cause. The mission of Islam he now fed on had given him an impossible dream of Islamic purity. Out of this purity, there was going to come power and accounts would be set up to the world. Sixteen years later, in 1995, the holiday inn was surrounded by towers of concrete and steel. Land was precious here. The race course view I had known could not now be reconstructed. It was half mythical, like the Roman hills before the building of Rome. And all over Kuala Lumpur, there was much more at the back of the hotel where I was staying, an immense hole was being dug across the road. The hole had the area of a large city block. It dwarfed men and machines. Ramps led down from level to level, from river to dry paper. The composite tropical greenery of colonial days was overshadowed now by an international style in steel and glass stone and concrete and marble, and the very climate seemed to be water. Air conditioning made the big buildings cold. The weather outside was always a little, a little surprised, and it was pleasant for the visitor to play with these temperature shifts. In 1979, Malaysia had been rich. Now it was extraordinarily rich. I wondered about the effect on Charlie. I knew that before he'd begun to work full-time for the Muslim Youth Movement, he'd worked as the managing director of a Malay construction company. He was very young at the job, but there were not many business minds in Malay at the time. The firm hadn't done well. There were big players in the construction business. And then Charlie had set up a reserve. He'd failed. He thought this was because his Chinese workers and almost everybody else had let him down. 
the failure of creed, like that. It has got mixed up in his religious ideas. And I wonder whether, with the great new wealth of the country, and all the encouragement the government had been giving to Malays to go into business, Charlie had been tempted to try again. He would now be 48 in middle life. His career, whatever it was, would have been more or less marked out. But I couldn't find out about Charlie. The people who had known him in the old days had lost touch with him. He was a preacher, I was told. He was on the move. He wasn't easy to reach. And then one morning, I was taken to an Islamic commune on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur to meet a man who said he was shot and said he remembered me. The commune was a solid settlement of two-story concrete houses. The houses were painted and the roads were paved and there were gardens and cars. Whatever the commune people might say about their self-denying way of life, they were part of rich Kuala Lumpur. We had to look for the house of the man who said he was shot. When we found it, I found he didn't, I didn't know the man. He pretended for a little, but only for a little, and only in a half-hearted way that he remembered me. He was in his fortunes, and he looked happy and idle, enjoying the communal life. His house on two floors had a big, open, well-furnished hall downstairs. And he was playing there in the middle of the morning with a kind of vivid serenity with a sleepy eye that steady young child of his. It was a form of display. In this kind of commune, simple things could be paraded as religious or virtuous acts that gave a special pleasure to the believer as a reward. He said in a mechanical way that the big highway the government had built was wrong was opening up the country to bus. He said that the official language of the country should be Arabic. English was not the language of Muslims. But he had said these things so many times before that now he was on the floor trying to get the child to play with one of his many toys. Now he was speaking by rote, without energy. I felt that it was out of pure idleness that he had said he was shouting. He wanted only to get a little attention. There was no point in being fundamentalist and dangerous and living in a commune if no one noticed. And in fact, Charlie, whom in the end I never met because no one among his former associates particularly wanted me to meet him, Charlie had become like that idle man in their eyes. Once he had been at the center of the most of you, Malaysia movement using Islam to wake up the Malays. He had no other career. Now, though he had remained true to those early beliefs, he was on the outside. It embarrassed people to be reminded of him. He was a man who had taken the idea of the religious life to extremes. Another idea was the change. In 1979, Shafi, grieving for the village of his childhood, spoken of Malay as a pastoral, tropical people. Once he said they were a Chinese people. He meant only in the little sense of time. They were not commercially minded. They were without the energy of the Chinese, who came from a four-season country, as he said. He had worked these ideas, which were curiously colonial ones, into his overall religious view. They were not ideas that Malay likes now. A young lawyer said, that's been laid aside, destroyed almost. It has been replaced by the idea of the Malays as a trading and manufacturing and innovative people. These are all words you would not have associated with Malays in the past. The government has done all that it could to bring Malays into business. And over the last two generations, it has succeeded. The racial anxiety in the 16 years before had been swamped by the great new weather, and new men had been created on both sides. That was the message of the steam of concrete and glass around the side of the holiday inn, and the great highway to the forest that had opened up the villages and opened up new land. 
a journey to the interior that took six to eight hours along old roads that touched many of the old colonial towns and settlements now took two and a half hours and showed almost nothing that fast. The lawyer said, I think it telescopes down. In 1979, they had all been rather young in the Muslim youth movement. The leader, Anwar Ibrahim, the man of whom they all meet, the man who gave them confidence, was only 32, Shafi's age. Nasser, to whom Shafi had introduced him, was only 25. He was very much in the youth. Physically, he was even slighter than Shafi. He had just come back from Bradford in England, where he'd been doing a diploma in international relations. He hadn't liked the three easy sexual ways in England, and he didn't want those ways to play young Malay over there. Now Sir had an ancestor who was a Malay sheikh in Mecca. A sheikh was a guide, and this sheikh guided Malays who had gone to Mecca on the pilgrimage. This kind of guiding would have become a proper paying occupation only after the 1830s, when steam replaced sail and the journey from Malaysia became quicker and more reliable. And it is possible that Nasser's ancestor was doing this pilgrim work in the second half of the 19th century. It was the end of the 19th century, as I worked it out. This ancestor returned to Malaysia to a tin town, predominantly Chinese. 20 kilometers or so to the north of Kuala Lumpur. This man's son was Nasser's great grandfather. He married when he was 12. In 1934, when he was very old, he set up a Malay language newspaper that preached self help to the Malays. He was the voice of the wilderness. After him, the family declined. The tradition of learning faded away. There was little money in teaching. There was more. Nasser's grandfather, who should have been a religious teacher, became a rights father with seven acres. And Nasser's father worked as a major in the Forest Department. He had only the standard primary school education up to the sixth class, but he read the newspaper every morning before he went to work. This newspaper reading was important. It was Nasser's greatest intellectual stimulus. Nasser was one of seven sons, and the fourth of eight children. When he was eight, he began to read the newspaper, like his father. It was an advanced thing for the Malay child to do. In time then, Nasser, the rage of the son, the farmer's grandson, was able to go to Bradford to do a diploma in international relations. And now, 16 years later, only 41, he was running a holding company banned the di diversity of gay companies. Nasser had a suite of offices in the skyscraper. The shadow of the skyscraper fell on the green glass skyscraper across the road. This made the road seem narrower, and the mid-afternoon tropical light, which would have been harsh and stinging in open fields and open streets, softened in that narrow protective so that the light and climate in Kuala Lumpur seemed perfect. Nasser with glass and glass, and less frail looking than in 1979, was dressed in an executive's care, belted trousers, tan shoes, matching socks, stylish white tie, a large brown watch on his slender wrist. His personal assistant was a tall and gentle young in the main waiting room and in the antechambers of various offices were models like toys of white aeroplanes and silver sticks. Nasser's holding company had interests in education. They ran scheduled domestic lessons. It was an extraordinary transformation. And the man himself was welcoming and gracious, full of offers of help. It was as if good village ways had been given a kind of corporate. I had been moved in 1979 
like the goodness, the young man of the movement. They didn't hide things or make up things about themselves. Not so she could have that kind of openness still. He remembered what he had been in 1979. He didn't put a gloss on it. And he told with her prompting of the internal demons, the phobias, the lack of confidence that as a small town of age he had had to fire before he could do what I now saw. What they had been looking to religion to do for them in 1979, simple power and simple authority of young men. I thought 
quán này đã biết rồi đó Những cái mà thế này mà cái này Tôi muốn cho các bạn biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết là các bạn đã biết rồi Tôi đã biết She was a worshipper of Chinese idols. People like her, Philip said, had now moved to a new form of Japanese music. He said, it's quite common, the Chinese family throwing away their gods and joining this new Japanese Buddhism, which is based on strong humanistic traditions. I'm happy to them that they have liberated themselves. People who knew about his faith and his intellectual inclination wondered how he could work in the land. He told them, my understanding of Christianity is that we don't deny the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. His mother's honoring of the kitchen gods was mainly a matter of habit. She would like justice to them, place offerings for them. It was part of the routine of the day. And he said, even as a child, it had no meaning for me. When the time came to discard it, we just got rid of it like old clothes. We weren't worried that the gods would come to punish us. When I was 14 or 15, I felt the back, the void, the emptiness, cannot be articulated. For me, it was so tipitous that I chanced upon a chapel service. The second generation of Chinese in Malaysia had to anguish over the fact who am I beyond my shelter, my diploma, my degree? These questions were more rare than the second generation. The first generation was much too busy. For the Chinese, there is inherited wealth, inherited circumstances, but also the query, am I only my father's son? Thank you. In among the believers, you make the comment that if you think like that, then everybody is a political writer. How do you feel about the political criticism which has dominated the academic theory for the past few decades? Uh, I think it's trivial, actually. Uh, I think this idea of politics is a relic of Marxism. Marxism has disappeared from in the universities and it's done much damage to thinking and it's done damage because it's such an easy mechanical thing to apply to a text. You read a text you no longer have to say, is this good writing, is this nice writing, is this 
compassionate? Is it true? You simply say, is it legendary? Is it right? How much legendary? How much right? And that's your judgment. That's trivial. That's trivialized literature. Right. Have you come under fire from your academic critics for your sometimes less than glowing appraisals of Islamic nations and India in works such as Among the Believers and Beyond Belief? How do you feel about this? Read the first sentence. It says, have you come under fire from, from academic critics? Academic critics. For your sometimes less than glowing appraisals of Islamic nations yes. and India. Yes. I want to fool those critics out there. <laughs> the ones who wanted to run me out of town in 1981 uh, because they had another idea of the duty of things about to happen. And in fact, you know, the bombs are about to go off in, uh, in Indonesia and Bali and in other places as well. And uh, terrible oppression was to come from certain countries. But the academic critics were sitting happily in New York. And Boston and New Haven, you know, when they're very, very free, they were sleeping sound every night and thinking about their tenure. <laughs> In your novel lecture, you spoke at some length and very eloquently about history, or more particularly about your discovery of your community's past as in the lost El Dorado. How has history influenced your writings and the way you look at the world? I have a special interest in history, all history actually. Uh, I like to see the shape of the world, not only now, not only in the last hundred years or different years, but I like to take back as far as one can go, as far as the records allow us to go. Uh, and I think without that, that is an enriching view of the world. It gives one a, it gives one a balance. It uh, enables one not to get too excited or too agitated by certain things. I think it's important to me. It's not something I began with. It's something I, I learned. I was not given history. I learned it through my writing and through my reading. You have been a keen observer of Islam in its world context. Thailand is at present struggling to understand the key issue of Islamic fundamentalism, particularly in its Southeast Asian context. Have you had an opportunity to observe or study Islamic fundamentalism in Southeast Asia? And what is your opinion about this issue? Well, of course, I've been, I went to Indonesia, I've been to Malaysia, I've spent many, many weeks in both places. Uh, and the fundamentalism there is, uh, is the fundamentalism of people who wish to stamp out their own culture, stamp out their own rituals. And in, uh, in a place like Indonesia, probably to do away with uh, the Wajai. You know, the puppet shows, which have a Hindu origin, the Hindu rhythm, the Hindu moral, the moral, moral ideas. Uh, so the fundamentalism is, in fact, people being told they have to destroy their own past. It's a very brutal thing to tell people. In your Nobel lecture, Nobel lecture, you stated that I am the son of my books and that at any my literary career, it could have been said that the last book contained the others. In what way are your literary works the embodiment of your experience, identity, philosophy of life? Could you please explain how your latest book, Half a Life, might contain the others? Well, it contains it in a very simple way, but it's all the way of narrative. It's very narrative style is the uh, style of a man who's written in a certain way. Uh, its ideas come from feelings that have developed over a lot of travel and a lot of, a lot of uh, thinking and a lot of reading and a lot of 
right check. They're not, it's, not the, it's not the work of a young man. Uh, the idea that uh, our life, we might always be living other people's life, not living our own life, you know, it's possible for that. That's an idea that could, that could come only at the end of a lot of thought, a lot of traveling. It has been said that one of your goals as a writer has been to continue the tradition of British travel writers. Writing, British travel writing, following the tradition of English writers like George Orwell, Ian Foster, Evelyn Waugh, or Somerset Maugham. Our Thai audience would like to know whether or not this country has any potential of being featured in your future writing. <laughs> I will deal with the Thai question of the Probably I have to deal with that now. Yeah. I don't know what would happen. I, I probably am probably am too old now to, to embark on the new book and on the book Thailand and things like that. So we have to deal with that. But uh, the first part of the question about it has been said that you are so and so like English foreign writers. That actually was an observation of my own. Uh, and it's been twisted very subtly. I said, when I began to travel and have to write about it, write a book about it, I had no models. And the only available models were these English writers, these imperial figures. And the point about saying that was that I had to start traveling and thinking in my own way. So the point I was making was absolutely opposite of what has come out. <laughs> but I think it's like that I write about that. You mustn't mind. People I write about don't like what I say. <laughs> you have acknowledged that writing nowadays in today's world of labels and ideological divisions is a difficult task. Do you feel that the writer who produces art for our sake, or my sake, according to D. H. Lawrence, Still has a role in today's world? Well, I've never liked that idea of part of my sake or part of our sake. That's these antique ideas. These are ideas that began in the late 19th century and then were taken out in the early 20th century. Uh, and what, is, what has happened at the end of that century, 20th century, is that uh, literature has been has been destroyed. The ideal literature no longer exists. All these lovely tools we are using, these microphones and people's uh, uh, telephones, that kind of technology becomes its own excitement. It becomes its own cultural activity. And it's atlas to television, proliferation of uh, these, these programs and these soap operas. And add to the idea of the marketing of books. In publishing. In publishing, yes. Which, uh, and if you market books now successfully, you probably will. You write about green men, you write about uh, ghosts, you write about wizards, and then you sell many millions of books. Now, that success of that book buries the idea of literature, the old idea. Looks hard at the real But probably people no longer need this way of looking at the real world. And probably that's why literature is no longer no longer an idea to live for or to die for. Mm. Alright, I'll give you a, 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 a more light-hearted question, which says, tell us about your fascination with cats. And who was that cutie in the picture with you in the dust jackets of your book published in 2001? Who's the cutie? <laughs> I, I got a cat. I got a cat. A cat six years old. And uh, I had no cat, no animal at all in my life. And then one day, um, many years ago, uh, 
straight at came to my house. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I now know the Catholic Church in great affection. You were terrified of I was, yes, I'm afraid of me. I'm afraid of getting asthma. Yeah. I'm afraid of all of that. And uh, so I half adopted the cat. And the cat used to rebuke me when I came back after many days away without doing anything about it. And uh, unfortunately, the lady who was working for me didn't obey me one day, didn't feed the cat, uh, instead took the cat back up to a place where it was being tormented and from which it escaped me. And uh, I was so moved by all of that. We got pictures of that. That first animal came up my back. I had a feeling it had been given, it had been sent to me. And, uh, then I had a replacement. It was a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.